for those of you who are new, our genealogy tea and sympathy is a little more, um, it's, it's, well, it's all discussion for one. And we, in the past, this has been going for several years. And a lot of times it was just literally free form. You could talk about whatever you wanted to genealogy related. And we still keep it kind of open. So if you've got a really burning research question that you want to talk about, you're more than welcome to, to ask that question. But this year we tried to go with some topics. So um, goodness, I already can't remember half of my topics this year already, but we did mention military records the last time and, uh, and today's cemeteries and serendipity. So we're going to talk a lot about researching cemeteries, trying to find those ancestors um, wherever they decided to be planted in their final the final act there. Um, so the format is so far I'm going to kind of I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Sherry Daniels. I'm the head of library and archives at the Kentucky Historical Society. And we're going to try to go around a little bit. Everybody introduce themselves. Just let us know who you are and where you're where you're coming from right now. Um, obviously, we're in the state capitol here in Frankfurt. And um, if you've got a burning cemetery question too, you can you can propose it. We may not answer it right away because we're doing intro introductions. But anyway, so I'm going to go to to Vicky, who is at my la my my left over here. There you go. You got it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Sorry. I'm Vicky Vance. I'm in Lexington. Um, I don't have any burning questions today, but I'm very interested to see what what the others are and what what's going on. Welcome. Thank you. How about, I got Anissa on my right now. Hey, I'm Anissa Penn Davis. Um, I am in the sales. And when I saw the title was Cemeteries and Serendipity, I got really excited because Sherry knows I have like quite a few cemetery stories. One is in a book. I'm the only non-Mormon in the book. And so I pulled it out in case we were telling stories. Uh, the only cemetery issue I have is my second great grandparents um, who died of tuberculosis within three weeks of each other in Winchester. Uh, well, my the grandmother died in Winchester and then my grandfather died in Justman County um, because he and the kids went to live with his sister. Um, her obituary says um, buried in this town. You're, you're in, I guess the cemetery, meaning the Winchester Cemetery is how everybody has read it not there records burned um and his obituary says he's buried with her so yeah i don't know there's no deeds um there's no stones family had money yeah so i'm trying to figure out which cemetery they were actually discussing you know back in um, 1890. yeah my my great-grandmother died of tuberculosis and her burial place has actually been a mystery too so yeah good times um so i see next i see in line is it Jay Wayne Merrill? Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm in Columbia, Missouri. I uh, have a lot of Kentucky relatives, but I think most of mine do not have headstones. That's the problem. <laughs> gotcha. Welcome. And I know Anissa will have a story later to talk about cheap headstones. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Linda, Linda Colston, I see you're next. Hi, I'm Linda Colston, and I'm in the Bald Knob section of Franklin County today. And no burning issues. We do have a mysterious burial next door that we've always heard a man's buried there by the tree, and we everything's grown over, so we have no idea who it is. But we used to be the main road through Franklin County. So we don't know if he died at the side of the road or what. Is it, mar is it marked? Nope. Nope. Just nope. Nope. In fact, the neighbor was kind of bulldozing over it recently. Oh. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, Linda. Linda's also a KHS employee, by the way. She's one of our, she's our, one of our library technicians and genealogist. So she gets a lot of the research. Um, I see a lady named Margie next in line. Um, my name is Margie Singer and I'm in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Um, I have an issue. I was very successful in tracking down my husband's family um, who were the burdens from there in Frankfurt. 
but uh, now I'm working on my family and the issues I have are all in Breckenridge County. Um, there seems to, and they, it was the Lewis family and they uh, passed away. There was the, uh, the mother, the father and one of the children passed away in 1826. So I'm thinking it might've been a tuberculosis outbreak, but I don't know that for sure. And they lived on a farm and I think quite often then people were buried on the property. Um, they're related to the Owens family as well. So I'm trying to track their burial down. And then uh, one of their daughters is my great grandmother and they lived in um, Hardensburg in Breckenridge County. And she died in 1832 and I can't find where she's buried. So those are my issues. They're all in the Breckenridge County area. Okay, great. Uh, we'll have some, uh I'll share some resources too for you that um, might be able to hunt down some older inventories and such. Thank you. All right, so next I see Melissa. Melissa Howard. Hello, um, I'm Melissa Howard. I'm from Breathitt County. Um, many of our ancestors did not have any kind of gravestone marking where they were at, um, but we're just out here. This is our first, our first forum that we've went to. So we're just trying to, to learn more about it. Sounds great. Uh, next on my list is Linda McCauley. Um, I live in Mount Vernon. Uh, I came across some notes, a Word doc, uh, and a bunch of pictures the other day that I started in 2008 to do a cemetery book on a little family cemetery here in Rockcastle County. And uh, I'm thinking maybe I'm going to try to finish that sometime. <laughs> Uh, soon and uh, maybe print a few copies to throw one at KHS, one at the local library here and a few like that and and uh, put it on my website as a as a free download for anybody that wants it. But so. Great. Uh, next I see Richard. Richard Rice. I live here in Frankfurt. I'm a little closer to the new capital than Sherry is right now and just a little farther away from the old one. Uh, I have no issues today. I'm just glad to be back. I, it's been a while since I've been on. Uh, I'm a bubble with uh, computer stuff, so uh, I don't do very well. But I learn a lot from you all, and I thank you all for taking part in these things. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, for those of you who have never been to one in person, we we usually have quite a quite a spread, a lot of treats, and we, we eat a lot. <laughs> we drink a lot of tea. So yeah, it's a little it's a little different. That's why I'm trying to keep the tea and I've, there's some teapots behind me, but that's about it. <laughs> Not a lot going on in person. But anyway, next on my list is Fanny. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Fanny Salmon. I'm an adopted Lexingtonian, although you can probably hear from my accent. I was uh, born and raised in Normandy, France. I come from Lexington, sister city, Deauville. I have no direct Ken Kentucky ancestors that I know of, but I'm uh, fascinated by history and uh, I've been researching some families in Fayette and Chesamine County. Uh, so and it's, it's a great opportunity to exchange with people and not feel so isolated. So I'm glad I can join you tonight. Wonderful, welcome, Benny. Um, next on my list, I see Rose. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I'm Rose Gorham. I tra maybe traveled the furthest to be with you. I'm in Rockford, Illinois, and I started working on my father's uh, side of the family. He was, uh, my ancestors are, are from uh, Clinton and Wayne County, Kentucky. And when I first started researching my father's family, the first couple of people that I talked to, that I located, that I talked to a kind of a, one in Indiana, one here in the Rockford area, for, they, they couldn't wait to tell me a story about a, 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 an ancestor that did something really, really bad. And his na last name is Owens. Anyway, which is my main, he's my, um, my great grandfather's older brother born in 1860. Anyway, if we have time later, I can tell you the story. It's a hair raising story and it happened in 1892, a few days before Halloween. After 20 years of working on that, on trying to find where he is buried, I discovered it at four o'clock in the morning in June of 
19, in June of 2019. And at four o'clock in the morning, there's nobody I could call. I'm doing the genealogy dance. And there's nobody I could call at four o'clock in the morning to tell him I solved the mystery of where he's buried. He, That's he, died, cool. he died in Eddyville prison, did something really, really bad. But anyway, if we have time later, maybe I'll, I'll tell you the story. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's fitting gonna... for this time of the year, but it's, it's hair raising. <laughs> We're gonna to want to hear that definitely. So keep that one loaded. <laughs> All right. Next well, one. Halloween story since it's happened at right a few days before Halloween. <laughs> Absolutely. So next on my list, I see Elaine. Hi. Um, I'm from Southwest Florida, and I have relatives named Garant, Glover, and Alexander, and they lived in Montgomery County. And so I have some stuff on them and lots of spaces on them. And I have the feeling that many people die in 1852. Oh, I mean, I, I'm doing this research and in the different families I'm connecting with, 1852 can be a really bad year. But uh, I was on one of your other Zooms and I find it very, very interesting. Great. Thank you. Great, thanks, Billy. Next on my list, I see Bill. <laughs> nice to meet him. Hi, <laughs> I'm Bill Birchfield. I'm the librarian here at KHS, and I'll be trying to demonstrate some of the sites and stuff as we go through the Tea and Sympathy today. And I am working on getting some, uh, to answer Carol in the chat, I'm working on getting the links to the various things, including a straight link right to the video that Andrew and I did, that, that Richard was talking about. Great. That's all for me. All right. Now next in line for me is Claudia. Um, well, I think I'm coming from the farthest distance because I'm in Oakland, California. And of course, the picture behind me is not Oakland. It's Scotland. Um, my, <laughs> my cat just decided to jump up. My father's family was from Lexington, Kentucky. And um, I, I think in my search on Ancestry.com, I came across a hand-drawn up uh, cemetery plot with maybe a dozen graves in it. And um, they all had, many of them had the same names. And my middle name is Johnson. So Claude Johnson was a prominent name. There were like six or seven of them. In fact, my grandfather, maybe great-grandfather Claude Johnson was mayor of Lexington at a time. So, you know, I someday I hope to get to Lexington and actually see the cemetery where they're where they're all buried. Sounds great. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, next I see Alice. Uh, I'm Alice Br Rice Bratcher and I live in Louisville close to Simpsonville. Not very far from Sim Simpsonville. Um, one of the one's the, trying to locate a Schultz burial in Ohio County, Matthias Schultz. He was a revolutionary soldier. There's a Schultz Cemetery and it's on the Schultz Road. There might be an, another little Schultz, but I understand, if I understand the rules of the NSDAR, they have to know exactly where somebody's buried, but the SAR, the Sons of the American Revolution, if you think you know where they're buried, they will put a marker in a cemetery, even if you're not really sure. Is that right? Well, um, Nissa, anybody want to feel that one? I mean, I, 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 I was never made to prove where someone was buried, just the documentation that proved a death. But you wanted to mark the grave, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 that's what I sort of understand the SAR, you know, um, you get the group to ha have it done. It, it feels sure that it, it's in the Schultz Cemetery there on Schultz Road where Matthias lived, but then there's another little one. And of course, sometimes I have one relative there that they would have been buried in the cemetery, but it was in the winter and the snow and so forth. And they, they couldn't get to the cemetery. So they just, you know, buried them alongside or the house or something. So sometimes people get buried because of the weather when they have to. 
put them to rest. Sherry, it's my understanding in order to mark a grave for DAR that they have to know, you know, where they're yeah. exactly. Yeah. But the SAR, so you can get the SAR hopefully to do it. That's what we're trying they're to do. They're a little bit more lenient on things. So you're looking at like a, a specific type of marker then. So it's so a DAR marker. That's what we're looking at, right? Something. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, next on my list is Brenda. Hi, uh, this is my first time on Key and Sympathy. I live uh, south of Charleston, South Carolina. So um, I've been interested in the fact you do this. I actually was on the board at Berea College, uh, board of trustees for quite a number of years, uh, 12, I guess. So I did get up to Kentucky about four times a year. Um, and all of my ancestors on my father's side are Kentuckians and they were all clustered in southeastern Kentucky so Madison County primarily but Rockcastle County, uh, Garrett County, Lincoln County. I've walked in I would say 50 or so cemeteries there. Uh, that being the best way to feel like you've really made some sort of connection. Uh, I don't have any real burning questions as you say but I do say the best cemetery books that I've encountered in Virginia or Kentucky are in Madison County and um, you know directions of how to go to the you know third little house on the right and knock on the door and ask if you can climb the fence <laughs> exactly how to get to those family graveyards the only difficulty in Madison County being how many graves were moved and ultimately lost from the bluegrass depot, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But um, there are some records that you can use for finding those ancestors. But thank you. I'm glad to be here. And I productive research at uh, the library in Frankfurt and uh, also out at the archives, although not as productive there as at the historical society. Great. Thank you. I'm, I'm jealous of you being near Charleston now, I have to say, with the warmer <laughs> weather. But oh, well. <laughs> Mary Clay. Hey. Hi. So glad to see all these faces. I missed you all. Thank you. <laughs> I don't have any burning cemetery situations, except that um, the great grandmother that I've been looking for for tw 20 years, uh, how she died, when she died, where she's buried, I'm still doing that. But uh, right now I'm spending all my time looking for trying to figure out um, DNA matches. I've had a bunch out of Lincoln County, Smith, Gardner's, and Whitley's. And it's not just a fluke that one person, I have a bunch of people have no idea. They have no idea and I have no idea. So we've been together trying to figure out how in the world we're related and we're no closer than when we started. <laughs> and anyway, it's, again, it's good to see everybody. You too. It's a great lockdown activity, though, I have to say, yeah. <laughs> trying to wrap your brain around DNA results. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to skip over the other Richard because he looks like he's on the phone. So how about we'll go to Carol next? Hi. I'm staying in the dark today. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm, I'm, st I'm staying in the dark today because I had dental surgery and it's not a pretty sight. I'm less gorgeous than usual. I'll put it that way. Yeah. A lot of swelling. Anyway, my research is primarily in Barron County. And I am curious about the epidemic, the cholera epidemic that went through there in, I think around 1840. And because my the people I'm researching, the Wolf family that I'm researching sort of disappeared. I'm thinking they might have been wiped out in the epidemic. Has there anything been written about where these people were buried? Was it mass burials? Did, were they individually buried? Or is that too early to even know what happened to them? It, it wiped out one entire count, town. I want to say Gainesville or Galesville. I, I can't remember the exact time, but it was in Barron County. 
And uh, I just, I'm curious about it. Was there anything written about it to tell what happened, to what they did with them? Great, thank you. Actually, well, um, I do have a couple of potential tips on that, but um, I'll, I'll bring that up in just, uh, just a couple of minutes. So okay. I'm gonna go on to the next person. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks for coming. I see Rose Lewis. There, I get it unmuting. Yeah. Um, I'm, I live in Georgetown. Um, my family came from LaRue, Hardin, Hart counties. Um, I'm interested in how you figure out, I think there's a cemetery where several of them are buried in Hammondsville, which is in Hart County. And I think some of them, my grandmother said, you know, they didn't have gravestones. They died, I think, in the 1918 epidemic. And how, how to find out, you know, histories of cemetery records or where you go to look for that. There's a church next door, which I think might be a possibility, but you know, who keeps those records? All right. Thanks so much, Rose, for coming. Um, I think, I think uh, let's see, I think Richard Oler is back. Would you wanna tell us about yourself? Um, yeah, I, I was on last time just to kind of see how things work. I'm a transplant. I'm from, I'm actually from the Chicago area and um, um, Fort Knox brought me here. <laughs> I should say the army brought me to Fort Knox yeah. and uh, I've been here ever since. So, uh, Wonderful. but I've uh, been doing, uh, it, it made several trips around the, uh, the Commonwealth, uh, two different places. Uh, and one of them were, you know, a few of the cemeteries around uh, and those kinds of things. But um, uh, I'm currently retired and can do some of those things once we get through the pandemic again. Um, I did go to Fort Nelson and I've been to a, actually a cemetery in, uh, in, in Crab Orchard. Mm -hmm. Some are familiar with that. Yeah. Um, and then I'm trying to remember a couple of the other places I've been uh, as far as that goes and seeing how they're laid out and they're laid out by sections depicting different things. And um, I was trying to catch if you were going to be uh, entertaining that as well of how that worked. Um, and I've been doing a lot of um, looking around the cemeteries in the Chicago area to do my genealogy. Uh, but as I think I mentioned last time I was on, uh, I have a problem with uh, uh, with the Chicago fire, and that's you know, posing a problem uh, in getting information for some of the ancestors about two and three rows up. Uh, so, uh, right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks but, for coming again. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> uh, let's see. I see Sharon. So uh, I do have been doing research for uh, probably 40 some years now. <laughs> um, started when I was a kid. And uh, my favorite thing is to go to cemeteries and to walk through them. Um, I, my family has had to stop on more than one occasion to let me out to walk a cemetery, looking for family and so forth. Um, but there was one cemetery that um, eluded me until recently, um, actually last year. And that's one for my uh, state and family. And they have their, a, a family cemetery that they have church in once a year, a big family reunion. And I have been wanting to go to that for ever since I heard about it because I didn't know where the cemetery was. And I met up with some of my family um, there last year, last September and, or two years ago. And uh, they, I followed them all the way back in the, into the mountains in Pike County and <laughs> in Floyd County and was able to finally get up there and to see where my great grandfather was buried, my great, 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 great grandmother and <laughs> everything. So all my family has been buried on from that branch has been buried there. In fact, everybody in the cemetery except for one person is either direct family member or married in and sat there for the church and then the big dinner afterwards so that was a lot of fun but I'm actually in Winchester I do go I walk in the Winchester Cemetery um, a couple of times a week and also um, have done with some stuff with cemetery preservation so it's a it's been fun so yeah 
Yeah, it's great. Know. Lots of adventures in cemeteries, definitely. <laughs> oh, and, definitely. Uh, yeah, I have to say that was probably one of the ways, especially as a, as a kid, I, that I was snagged. I was totally hooked with the cemeteries. And yeah, my grandmother, great grandmother, and mother all took me around to bury cemeteries. And yeah, as a kid, it's even, it's even a great place to have adventures. So yeah, a welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, Thank next, you. I see Debbie Baker. Uh, I'm joining from Central Florida. I enjoy doing cemetery research and have been doing so for over 40 years and I've covered about 35, 40 states. Uh, I actually visited your collection uh, several years ago and found wonderful goodies for my newly, um, my newly married daughter's husband. Uh, his, his research is in the western part of Kentucky in the far west end of the state. Great. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. So I think that I think we ought to jump right into the topic about the epidemic burials. Um, because recently I this is this goes with the serendipity moment. We know we have a lot of serendipity moments in, in cemeteries. I've heard so many stories of people asking, asking the deceased, tell me where you are. <laughs> <laughs> and then getting there uh, just, you know, by seemingly by accident, there they are. Um, so this was a weird, um, I wasn't actually looking for this. So this wasn't any, any, any special force there helping me get here. But this was just one of those moments where I, I just thought I couldn't believe it was where that I found a record. Um, Linda and I, Linda Colson and I were in KDLA working on some of the Kentucky Ancestors Town Hall research for this year. During COVID, they had let us in because we were fellow state government workers. And um, I was just, I just happened to be in the deeds book for Fayette County. And this was 18, 1830s deed book. So with cholera in Lexington, you had a few different outbreaks that happened. And so, um, you know, 1830s, and then I know at least 50s, um, you know, so you had it pop up every once in a while. The 30s was specifically very, very tragic. You had a lot of deaths there. But I was, I had recently been researching about someone who had lost a father in that epidemic. And I actually wrote about it in Kentucky Ancestors. And so I had a picture of the grave. I knew where they were buried, but I was researching someone else entirely. And I'm gonna do a share screen here. So this was in, this was in the deed books. This is a complete, basically a plat map. This is of the Episcopal burying ground in Fayette County. And this was in the deed records. Now, I know that people were buried there as early as the early, like 1834, 35. This was presented in November of 1837. Now I didn't go back. This is in the very back of the deed books. So I didn't, I, I don't see what court case or anything or any kind of transaction that it might be related to. There's a paragraph at the bottom and it just talks about who presented it. And I, I honestly was so kind of shocked that I saw this. Uh, so I just snapped pictures of it and then moved on. I know what D book it was in, but I didn't, you know, I, I didn't go back to research that. I was actually working on something else, but this is one of those weird places that you might come across a cemetery map or some mention of a cemetery. Sometimes don't forget that deeds would be a place that you could find that because sometimes there's a land transaction as far as someone giving up some other land to, to be a burial location. But um, that's just one of those weird places. I just wasn't expecting it. And so how about anybody else who got any stories about, um, how about the, we were talking about epidemic burial. So I know there's some other counties here that people have mentioned. So does anybody else have any advice for those trying to find well, some that were buried at that time? Um, Anissa here. Um, I go to Pisgah Presbyterian Church and that's where uh, my brother is buried. And in 1991, when uh, they went to dig his grave, they found bones and a lot of bones. And um, they determined that it was from the cholera um, epidemic and they had to bury rebury them very quickly because even you know decades later you still couldn't let those out in the air wow. and so duke is actually buried um down a little bit but it looks like um it's more than one person in that grave um, 
but there was no record that anyone was buried there. What it looks like, since it was so long ago, like here's the church, here is um, the cemetery. My brother is buried down by the fence, and it looks like that's where they buried a lot of cholera um, victims, um, but just didn't, you know, didn't mark it. There was nothing because my parents bought that grave and then realized they had to move down. And if you pay attention, you can kind of see this line going through um, the cemetery and you can pretty much figure out that that could be where they are. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I've gathered so far is that I, I don't, you know, each place I think probably was handling this differently, you know, they, you know, like mass graves in that area. And I mean, in Lexington, it was supposed to be so bad, you know, people were running off, they couldn't hardly get people to bury the bodies. So it was so those volunteers that were just pitching in to do it. One of them was um, Gideon Shryock, who was the architect that designed the, the state capitol just down from us, the older state capitol. And um, yeah, he got involved with, you know, burying the bodies that day or those those few days, I think right after his father died. So that one, he was, they were burying individual bodies, but yeah, a mass grave. And that's the thing, I don't know where you might get records as far as another location. I mean, unless there's something in the news that's telling newspaper telling what's happening at that time, I'm not sure exactly where, or, you know, if there's a, a, any kind of plaque or anything that went up as far as getting the names of those buried there, that's tough. Um, although Bill, actually, Bill, I might have you chime in on a little record that you pulled out of from, and you wrote about it, actually. I, I was going to mention that before we change over. It's a little off topic because it's not really cemetery related, but I actually wrote an article about using the National Library of Medicine as a resource for genealogists, and this definitely fits directly into that. Uh, different doctors not all doctors did it, of course, but doctors in, in various localities documented the, the different epidemics that they would run across, whether it be yellow fever or cholera. And sometimes you can get really lucky and your ancestor can be listed in uh, some of that documentation. I, uh, I'll, I'll put a link to my article uh, in, at KentuckyAncestors.org uh, it, it's the Kentucky Ancestors Online, and uh, it, it's a nice little article, and, and it can be a very valuable resource, but to be honest, you do have to get a little bit lucky here, too, because yeah, uh, e even back then, there were still some privacy concerns, so sometimes you'll find anonymized information, uh, and I just posted the link. Uh, Thankfully, the privacy concerns weren't nearly as prevalent as they are now. And, and so you actually did find some, some full names and, and all kinds of stuff. And so uh, doing some searching at the National Library of Medicine, you can sometimes get lucky. And, and you may not find a grave site, but you can potentially find out if your ancestor actually did die in a, a pandemic of some sort. Yeah. Yeah, and we found them from various parts of the state, far western, central. Um, Hitman County, and, 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 there, and there's some stuff on Lexington. And so there's small towns and big towns. And so it just depended on the medical practitioners in the area as to how well documented, and then whether they wanted to publish it or not. And uh, some of them still kept the documentation. And you might, if you knew about doctors in an area, you might look for a, a donation to a historical society somewhere because they may not have actually published it and they just kept the, the documentation about it uh, for their own practice, but then never actually did anything with it. So the, there's a couple of avenues that you can pursue in that, but uh, uh, stopping by the National Library of Medicine and doing a few searches, I'm just kind of follow my article on some ideas on how to do those searches and uh, see if you get lucky. But if, if you don't get lucky, it's still not the end of the world. Uh, start looking at local historical societies or state historical societies around the area and see if the uh, doctor that you happen to know that practiced in the area might have uh, somewhere along the line his descendants actually gave his information to a historical society to be preserved. Yeah, and I know there's a general question sometimes people are looking for those um, like basically pre-find a grave inventories or some sort of lists as far as 
where people were buried. And that's one of the things, one of the questions we get here. And there's a couple different things that we suggest. We have, we have local histories and sometimes local cemetery inventories that were published by the counties. So sometimes they've, they've mentioned stuff like that. With an epidemic, such as like cholera, or cholera, yellow fever, sometimes even victims can be listed in newspapers. It may not tell you where they're buried, but you know, that might happen there too. We have, gosh, we, we have surname files and basically county files and, and subject files. And sometimes, in fact, I removed them years ago and put them on the archival side of our collection. But we had some inventories that went back to like the 1920s where folks basically pre find a grave, they were still walking to cemeteries and taking inventories. And so sometimes, each, in fact, many of the counties have this, you know, sometimes they're little onion skin inventories that people have submitted to us over the years. So that's also another place that we can look to see if just, just random, if somebody had ever seen whether there was a stone that was placed. Now, if you've got an ancestor that, was, that never had a stone, obviously that's, that's even more problematic. Um, you know, we may not have anything on that, but anyway, that's something, and again, that's our collection, but as Bill mentioned, the local local areas may have their own inventories, inventories that people have submitted. So, yeah. All right, I'm on my second cup of tea. Anybody want to share a story? <laughs> well, I don't have a story, but I'd like to throw in something. Sure. Okay, just for this, especially the small town cemeteries and stuff, don't get hung up on the names of the cemetery because as I've discovered, the names change. So when you go looking for a cemetery, be sure and see who's in that cemetery, but don't get hung up if it's the Smith family, because you may end up finding your relatives there, even though there's no Smiths that you are aware of. Because sometimes I know my Spencer Cemetery changed names to the Chapman Cemetery, just in the course of maybe 10 or 15 years. So it may not always be the name that you're looking for as much as the location. It also might be that some people call it one thing and somebody else calls it something else. <laughs> that that little family cemetery I was talking about earlier, when I was going through photographing everything, I found a fairly recent burial there from the 90s. And the name was nothing I recognized and didn't seem to be connected to the family that was buried there. And I pulled his obituary and his last name was Harold. And he says he was, it says he was buried in the Harold family cemetery. No, that's the Ramsey Taylor cemetery. <laughs> and almost everybody else that's buried there is a Ramsey or a Taylor. So I don't know if they buried him in the wrong place <laughs> or if they just called it that for some reason. Yeah, in fact, I've got in this, in the session that I'm, that I'm teaching on video, which you'll be sent, there, I cover one of the cemeteries in my family history that sits on a county a county boundary, and it's at least known. I at least know about four names for this cemetery, and I even demonstrate that on the death certificates. Um, these people are buried in the exact same cemetery, but each each uh, location on the on the death certificate is a different name, and I know exactly it's the same cemetery. But it, it just happens to happen to be due to the evolution of the cemetery itself. It started as a cemetery standalone on one side of the road, then it was out in the rural area and they decided they needed um, a little chapel to have services there. So they built a little chapel on the other side. Then they started putting uh, other burials around that. And then that chapel turned into a little Christian church. So, which actually was called Cemetery Chapel Christian Church. So <laughs> it's, plus it was an IOOF cemetery as well. At least so some people call it that. It's, yeah, it's got at least four names that I know of, so it's crazy. And road, road's names change as well. Mm -hmm. So it could be, you know, this obituary says it's on this road, but then the road changes. Yeah, yeah. And, what, and what Linda McCauley was talking about too, I mean, yeah, just think about families, how they refer to that cemetery. I mean, I had to think back, what did my family call the cemetery? We had a lot of family there. We didn't go by certain you know, certain family name, but some people do. I mean, if that's, you know, that's, they consider that their family cemetery, they're going to grab that surname that they most identify with. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I have a story about my younger daughter in a cemetery. Uh-huh. And you know, trying to get your kids interested is always difficult. And so my younger daughter out of my two seems to be the one that's, I wouldn't say most interested, but the one most likely to go along with me. 
And so we were in a cemetery taking pictures for Find a Grave. We were in the Frankfurt Cemetery in an old part of the Frankfurt Cemetery the day or two after a storm had come through. So there's all kinds of sticks and stuff on the ground. Kid was wearing flip-flops, not regular shoes. We're walking through the old part of the cemetery. I'm talking to her. And then all of a sudden I realize she's not with me. And I turn around and she is white. Now this kid goes, has red hair, blue eyes. She's already pale. She was worse than that. And she was frozen in her spot. And I was like, are you okay? You know, what happened? She stepped on a stick and thought it was a hand or, you know, bone coming that she had. Yeah. And this was, you know, she was like a college freshman, I think, at that time. Yeah. My kids do test gifted, but sometimes you just can't discover that. Right. So can I tell my story? Can I read my story? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So doing my dad's family a long time ago, this is, and I know it's hard to see, this is Uncle Denny. Um, he lied about his age to get into the Navy in World War II. And this picture was taken um, a year or so before he died. Okay. And so it was really, really important to me um, to get these people. To, I was making a book for him and I knew time was not on my side. And so um, shortly after we did um, the book, um, this lady reached out, um, Ann Bradshaw reached out and said, hey, you know, do you have any stories? I'm like, <laughs> you've not met me. And so I submitted a story. And um, like I said, I think I'm the only non-Mormon in the book. Um, but um, I got published and, and the story is called For Uncle Denny with Love. Okay? And it, it's a cemetery story. Um, first of all, when mom and I would go to cemeteries and we get out of the car, I said, which way do you want to go? She'd say, I go this way, you go that way. And she would always find them. I, 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 there was no reason for me to be there, but here we go. It's only a couple of pages. Um, I've been working on my father's genealogy for several years. When I discovered my great uncle, Denny, um, Dennis Burns Penn, MD, our family patriarch, was having hip surgery, I knew I had to speed things up because I wanted him to have the genealogy records before he went to surgery. I was hitting brick walls with a few relatives so I pulled Aunt Katie in on the project. And I love the bloodlines. They're like a puzzle to me. My aunt loved the stories. She'd been battling a lung disease for years and it got to a point where all she could do was make a phone call or two to help the search along. One frustrating ancestor was my great grandmother, Neppy. Her parents died when she was young and no one knew much about her mother, Carrie's family, tuberculosis lady. Um, one day on ancestry.com, I noticed my cousin had listed Neppy's birth certificate. It had a mother's maiden name and I went from there. However, none of the people, hang on a minute. Yeah, I, I'm gonna skip part of this because some of this. All right, so anyway, basically Nepi had added information. Okay. So while on this trip, um, we visited a remote cemetery. Mom is good at finding headstones. She finds them before I can get out of the car. This layout had a church in the middle with a cemetery on three sides. Mom went right, I went left. As I was walking near the above ground crypts, I tripped over what I thought was a root. I almost hit the corner of one of those crypts. I walked to mom because as usual, she was finding people. As we went around the church and got close to where I'd fallen, I told her to be careful and went to find the root. No root, no stick, nothing to impede walking. While I was looking around, trying to figure out what I tripped over, mom again found the grave we were looking for. It was directly to the left of where I tripped and I never saw it. And there's more, but that's pretty much the cemetery section. Wow. That'd be Enoch Burns, a DAR Patriot. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, since we're going spooky, Rose, I know you had, you had a, a Halloween cemetery story didn't you you wanted to share with us me rose okay there you go yep i i do okay yeah i had been working on my mother's family for many many years and my sisters finally said what are you going to start working on dad's side so when that is i i started working on that was like 19 fall of 1999 i believe and it took me 20 years to find where this guy ended up but anyway um he, uh, the, the first, uh, first couple of people I talked to on my dad's side that I located, 
that I had never known before. They couldn't wait to tell me the story of my great grandfather's older brother that murdered his wife. His first, he murdered his baby, an infant, and then his later his wife. But the story is that they were on a covered wagon train coming back to Kentucky from Texas that year. And they'd been down there, I'm not sure how long, but they'd been in Texas, a covered wagon train coming back on their way back to Kentucky. And the, the wife had had a, had a, they had a baby and the baby, I don't know if it was colic or what, but it was crying and cry, it cried on and on. And the, and the husband said, he, he, you know, he just may have been stressed out for a lot of reasons, but he said, uh, if you, you have to stop that baby from crying and, and the baby still cried on and on, you know, it could have been that they, we don't know, we know that they were in axle, they were up to the axles, it was tough going, they were up to the axles in mud, and he may have been afraid of the baby alerting Indians, and you know, being attracted by Indians, but he took the baby, when the baby kept on crying, he took the baby and swung it by the heels and bashed its head on the wagon wheel. And he told his wife if she ever told anyone, he would kill her also. Well, anyway, they get back to Kentucky. Well, then and after that, they think they lost another child after that. There was about maybe, must have been illness, maybe two or, two or three years old, something like that. And so uh, one night, the kids were in, the, uh, the bunch, they had a bunch of kids. They had eight total. At, at, at this time, they may have just had seven. But one, the youngest one, I think, may have been in bed with them. In the middle of the night, he got up and he took that child and put it in with the other kids, in bed with the other kids, and he took an ax to his wife's head. And then when the, uh, he, then he slit his wrists, he, he wanted to die also. The kids, all the kids went, the oldest I think was 11. They'd had eight kids in about 11 or 12 years. She should have been the one taking the ax to his head in the middle of the night. But anyway, the kids went and hid in the woods. And so uh, when the authorities got to, got to the house, were notified and got to the house, there, it said, they said that their blood was running together on the floor and he begged, he begged the authorities to let him die also while well, they didn't. And so anyway, um, for his, and the father, this man's father was a prominent doctor in Clanton County and had been a doctor in the Civil War. And this this was in uh, this was in October that he he did this October of 1892, so uh, his father evidently had some pull in the because we cannot find any newspaper articles or anything about this. Uh, this was a big thing back in in those days, and so they, there was nothing. I've not found anything in in the newspaper at, at the library down there or even in the neighboring. At, at, over at uh, Wayne County at the library. Was, nobody's ever heard of, but yet there were, but yet the story made the Hamilton, Ohio newspaper, a Janesville, Wisconsin newspaper, and I think one in New York, it made, but there's, there's just, would he have been able to stop that story from being published, him being a prominent doctor? So I don't, I, we don't know. It's just really strange that we can't find anything. So I looked at, you know, and, and I, I worked off and on for years and couldn't find anything. And then when I started, well, I came home from uh, work one evening, uh, maybe eight years ago, something like that. And it was just, it was right before Halloween. <laughs> and, and it was an, there were two messages on my answer machine, an elderly, very elderly, frail sounding man Believing he was trying to reach me. He had found an ancestry or something that I was trying to, that I was researching his grant, what turned out to be, it was his grandfather. This man was elderly and not well. And he left two messages that in one day, I called him right back that evening. And we talked, he, he had, he's in his early eighties, not well. He had been to Oklahoma and had, had been told the story of how his parents was his dad died in prison in Eddyville he was sentenced to life in prison so he went to he went to Eddyville in 1893 and so uh but this uh, this man Troy was that had contacted me he'd been looking and looking for me and so he said that he he had always been told that his parents died during an epidemic or his grandparents, I mean, his parents had, his grandparents had died during an epidemic, and he found out the people in his relatives in Oklahoma thought he already knew the story, and he did not. 
he was, I mean, the, the man not well. It's a wonder it didn't do him in to find that out. He was horrified. So they came back from, he lived in Florida at the time and his wife. They came back and they then they went to Kentucky and located some relatives in, you know, to find out the, the rest of the story and went to the graves. His, his, uh, his grandmother is buried in a private cemetery. I've been to the cemetery there two or three times. It's a pri on private farmland, a cemetery with only seven, seven or eight graves. And so anyway, he, but he's just, he's just horrified that, that this happened. And he didn't know about it all these years. And he said, I knew my, my, you know, my brothers, you know, my brothers talked about it or my uncles and my brothers talked about it, but he said, never in front of us kids. So it was just a horrible thing. And when so my the you know the uh the kids were all raised by the, the mother's dead, the dad was in prison. So these other six remaining kids were raised by the grandparents down there, the doctor and his wife. And he said each one of them, as they graduate, as they got out of finished school, they got a, as they went as far as they could as soon as they could. They went to like most of them ended up in Oklahoma. So I started researching again and talked to a lot of people and I caught when I found out that we, well somebody down there found a receipt from a stone cutter that the the doctor uh, had ordered for his son what the 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 man that did the murdering the murderer died in Eddyville prison in 1898 five years he was there and that was it we and I have his hospital records from down there he was in the hospital it was like five five days for urine retention so we don't know if it was from a, a venereal disease, a beating, or if he, from by other prisoners because of what he had done to his wife and ba baby, or if it was, uh, they had a whipping stone. There's a man that Judge Bill Cunningham wrote a book about Eddyville Prison. And I have the book and I've been in contact with him, but we couldn't find where, you know, he the man was buried when he died. And uh, so, you know, we emailed back and forth several times and he gave me some ideas but um, it, it, we, somebody in the, a relative down in Kentucky started going through the family papers and found there was a, a stone. Uh, the doctor had ordered a stone for his son. It, it was a receipt from a stone cutter. I think twelve dollars for the stone and five dollars delivery. But it didn't say where the you know it was delivered to. But the story that the doctor had passed down, I think, if to told people was that his son ended up in a mental institution because that seemed less less bad when well, you're, you know, you're a doctor. It's not a, that doesn't do to have your son murder his wife and baby. So he didn't want it to sound so bad. He, he said it was, you know, it was, they, we thought he went to a mental institution. So my daughter and I, 10 years ago, went to Frankfurt to, you know, and, and started looking at, you know, and they couldn't find anything for us. And it wasn't until later that we found out that he had gone to Eddyville to the prison. But anyway, I found the grave, but I had talked to a woman down there I started calling Eddieville, the, uh, the historical society, and the woman got called me back, an older lady, and she was with the historical society, and she checked all like all the cemetery records in the area, and they they couldn't find him listed anywhere down there. And she, funny thing, she told me about uh, her, her mother. She said my mother, her, I think her mother is still alive at this time. It was like in her 90s, but she said my mother told me one time that, well, she should, I, she said, I think my mother and her, and her little friends, like they were in their teens, I think, she said, my mother and her little friends were kind of like the little rascals. They, they went to the uh, prison sometimes and entertained. They'd play their instruments and sing. There was a, a big auditorium at the prison and she, they would go there. And she said, she, I said to my mother, mother, what in the world were you doing over there? Don't you know that place is full of rapists and murderers? And her mother said, oh, no, no, it wasn't. They, they executed on Mondays and Fridays, Mondays and Thursdays, whether they needed it or not. <laughs> so but when I would call, when I, every time, everybody I talked to had the most hilarious, story, you know, wonderful stories. But yeah, I talked to the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the secretary of the, uh, the, uh, what's the head of the prison got, what's this, what's his title? Warden. You know, yes, the warden secretary. She said, I'm going to tell the story to, well, because they couldn't find any records going that far back either. But she said, I'm going to tell the warden this because he's really interested in, you know, in old history of this place. But I know they stopped using the whipping stone. Uh, there's pictures in this book that, that the judge wrote. There was an uprising, I think, around 1923. And I think his, I think it might have been his grandfather that was killed, among other people, because the grandfather was a, a guard there. 
but um, uh, it, was a hor it was a horrible place, but they did had a whipping stone, but I, and there's a picture of it, as well as old Sparky, but um, <laughs> the, yeah. the, all, all prisons call their, their electric chairs old Sparky, I guess. I but anyway, the picture of the whipping stone, and I think they stopped using that around, maybe around 1915, something like that, but we don't know what, I, I, I don't, you know, we don't know what Allison, what he died of, all, although urine retention could be, you know, something, there's a, a problem with probably kidneys. And I'm thinking, you know, beating or venereal disease or that whipping stone. Yeah. But anyway, so did I'm she, what probably. Did she say any, so the warden secretary, did she talk about much about where they, where they buried them? I mean, did the family. Well, no, I found out next, that's what, last June, I found out I was clicking on find a grave from different research, researching of a, 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 someone else's family that's not even related to me, but I know her. We're kind of pen pals from Lady in Indiana, in, in Indiana. And she gave me some of her family names and I started looking them up on find a grave. And I started clicking one thing after another and I stumbled onto him at this, at this cemetery in Eddyville. The judge told me that my best bet was be, way behind the prison, there's like a, a wooded area. And he said that back there, when, when pe families, when, the, when, the, when a prisoner died and they didn't have a family or they wouldn't claim them, which was mostly the case, they were buried way back there in these, you know, back the, past the, in the tree line. And he said, your best bet is to go there in the fall when all the, you know, the, the, the foliage has died back and you'll see indentations in the ground. Well, as it turns out that he's actually in a cemetery, but his there's two listings. One of them, his name, there's wrong information and I've tried correcting it. One of them, his last name is spelled wrong, but I found it, stumbled onto it. And there's a picture there are two, actually, I think there's at least one photo of his stone. And that was the one that his fa doctor father paid for and had delivered, but it just, the receipt just didn't say where it was to be delivered. But so 20 years took me to find where he was. But I was yeah, I'm probably the only one in the family now that knows where he is. <laughs> so they said, indentations back there i'm assuming there were no stones do you right, know no, yeah, no stones stone? yeah did you know if they do you know if they kept any record like if the family ever they don't no, they home? don't have records back they no don't they don't. their prison or not the prison no and they're i'm not sure why they don't have well the one that well actually i think judge um judge cunningham is one of them that put a picture on and made one entry he's got the name spelled right at least but he he commented here I, I put, I made notes that night. Um, it says, his is the last marked grave toward the wood line in the African American portion of Riverview Cemetery in Eddyville. He is roughly 20 feet below the spike monument of Ike Copeland. And it says, and then he goes on to say, no explanation available for why Mr. Owens was in Lyon County or why a white male is buried in the African American portion of the cemetery. He had evidently forgotten that he and I, you know, because he was interested in this story that, you know, that I told him a number of years ago, but, you know, he probably forgot all about it. And I've lost track of how to get a hold of him to let him know about it. But uh, yeah, he had some, there was some wrong information on there. But, um, yeah, when it, when uh, when Allison died, his doctor father refused to let him be buried in the family cemetery. That's why he's not there. His wife, doctors, the doc, doctor and his wife are there, and she's an Indian woman. The, the Nancy that got that uh, was murdered is there. One of their at least one of their children is there. There's probably another unmarked grave that might is, would be a, the second child, and then uh, the doctor's parents are there. So there's. There's like eight people total in that. I've been there. It's fenced off and it's on private property. You have, there's a locked gate. And at one time there's horses. Horses were knocked the fence down and were allowed to trample through there. And the stones got all busted up and the family went and when they discovered it, went and patched up the stones and stood them up again and put up new fence. But there's the horses or cattle or something were allowed to trample it. And it's just really sad, but you can't get there's a, but anyway, that house, I talked with, um, talked with people, a lady a few years ago when we were down there for a reunion, she, an elderly, two sisters and an, their elderly brother that were in their 70s and 80s, they knew the story, they filled us in on some of the story because they own the property now where the doctor's farm was, and they said she was in that house years ago, she knew people that lived in that house, 
because it's it was up and and she said they never could get the blood stain out of that floor back in those days the floor were, were those old wide rough boards and then the guy that lives on the property now when i was down there five years ago he said a tornado had come through i don't know maybe 10 15 years ago and took what was left of the house down and he said when the men neighbor, neighboring men went to clean up all the you know the debris and stuff you could he said you they could still see the blood stains in between in between the boards when they, you know, when they cleaned up the debris after the tornado. So that, it stayed there for a long time. But yeah, it was, it was a very bad story. You didn't, you didn't happen to um, submit a family history mystery to Kentucky Ancestors Town Hall, did you? Huh? Did you submit a family history mystery to us? <laughs> Bill, Bill and Linda no, were no, like, because no. one of the questions we actually got once upon a time was, um, how to get the blood stains out of the floor um, based on a murder, oh, no. murder that had happened. So yeah, apparently that that can be a problem in Kentucky. There's <laughs> yeah, but more than yeah. one people have that issue. Um, so yeah, so that's that's really great. That's I know we've also had issues as well with those who were in um, uh, in mental asylums back then as well. You know, locating bodies that were buried there is also usually unmarked um you know and so that's always yeah. been a big issue i know with eastern state in lexington that's been a big problem um now i did have a great 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 uncle that was in eastern state and he died but his family did come and get him and took him back to the county from where he came from um but not everybody did obviously so you know that was pretty hard to you know it was difficult that wasn't an easy task to do actually well, anyway. I, I have i started making a list of of, of hair raising stories in my family not long ago and i think i'm up to at least 10 stories that would t stand people's hair on the ends but that's probably the worst one though <laughs> yeah, there's some great. other bad ones yeah yeah, yeah you like a, a great uncle that took that worked for al capone in the 20s when he was a young man and he drove limo for al capone and then turned into a bank robber his story would be be better than Dillinger's story if they made a movie of it, but I'm not telling the story and I know more than anybody about it. <laughs> so. um, does anybody have any cemetery questions or comments they want to they want to share? I know this is uh, we also talk about serendipity. You can also talk about moments when you maybe found uh, found a grave that you were surprised to find, like you know Nissa tripping over that <laughs> imaginary root, <laughs> which I find to be funny because you know then that your daughter thought you know that there, you know, so I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. It's a similar experience. It felt like it was, you know, how like there's like a long tree root or not really a tree root, but like vines or something and you walk and you just don't pick your foot yeah. up and that's what did it. Yeah, nothing, nothing there. <laughs> nope, nothing. <laughs> oh gosh, anybody else? May I ask a question and you may not have any idea. Sure. Do you, do you have any inkling, any idea of how complete the uh, find the grave sur uh, surveys of your counties are. Oh, in our in our collection, is that what you're talking about here at KHS? Um, not not necessarily there. I mean, yes, that too. But uh, when you look at find the grave. You know, um, in in a particular county, um, I, I know sometime here they they have they well they think maybe ninety percent of the cemeteries have been covered. Do you have any idea of how complete uh, the coverage is for Kentucky County? I don't. Um, I, I I can let anyone else pipe in if they. It depends on the county a lot. I mean, I know that actually Bill and I live in Scott County, and I know that Scott County started. They started their own canvassing again, and they've been doing it locally, and they were really militant about it. But it was fantastic. I mean, they had these really detailed maps, quadrants of the county, and people were assigned to go canvass them. Now I don't. Think they put them up and find a grave. I think they were actually leaving those as a local resource in their Kentucky room, but um, it depends on the efforts of each county. So I've not I've not known of any percentage listing for them. But um, and some some counties need a lot more help than others. So yeah, anybody else heard anything about percentages on that? No. I have a question about uh, undertakers. 
Sure. <laughs> I wasn't having any luck with the cemetery, but on the death certificate, it would list the, the undertaker. Mm -hmm. And um, I know sometimes undertakers have really good records on family or, you know, death, birth and death. Is, but when I Googled the undertaker, couldn't find anything. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if there, is there any kind of undertakers, you know, I know they have to be licensed. So is there any kind of group, you know, that would maybe have undertaker records or lead you to where those records are? Or? Hmm. I've, Not that I know of. Um, I've had a little experience here um, we, we went to an undertaker in the town and he had two sets of undertaker records that had been passed on to him and he was just holding on to them, uh, but they went way back into the 1800s. Oh, what county is that? Well, it, it's in a Missouri county. Oh, it's in Missouri. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, the only thing I, I know this is a really, really super long shot. This is not an actual advice, but <laughs> I'm just gonna say, you know, the only thing I could think of is because the undertakers were a lot of times in in the city, you know, in the cities, in the city directory, I almost I almost would call cold uh, cold call a uh, a place where the last known building. Did, this, did you find anything in the basement or in the attic? Is there anything as far as records? You yeah. know, because. It's like I've heard, I have heard st horror stories of people finding stashes of stuff like that. Because as far as I knew, there was no central place that people were supposed to like deposit those records. You know, now if there was a local, if there was a county cemetery board, maybe. But honestly, even then, that's a cemetery. That's not, you know what I mean? So I don't even know. KDLA might know a little bit, but I don't well, know. that question. Comment about licensing undertakers. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, of course, you don't see that until the late 1900s. Uh, embalming became a thing, and, and, and then eventually they started licensing. But if you've gone through all of those periods and you have an earlier period, you might want to look for an area's liveries licenses. Very often, the liveries were licensed. And time and time again, undertakers got started uh, because they had the local livery. They had the horses and wagons wagon. <laughs> the body out to the cemetery. And that's how they came to be uh, funeral directors. Uh, now also cabinet makers would go into that business because they often made caskets on the side. But I have found some very interesting uh, records in licensing that pinpointed to me uh, different people who eventually became undertakers but their original job in town was holding your horse while you visited or uh, renting you a horse if uh, you needed one so uh, livery stations are a precursor in many areas to the funeral director you know that brings up another issue too i wonder mary if i wonder if again this is a total long shot but i wonder if were the records ever absorbed maybe by a, by another undertaker? I mean, did, you know, was there somebody more prominent? I mean, where my mom was from, I remember there was, I guess, a few different funeral homes or undertakers, and then they basically narrowed down to two. Did they ever, I wonder if they ever transferred their files into somebody that was, you know, still staying active, I don't know. Well, you've heard my story about the Frankfurt records before. <laughs> that Rob funeral home that handled all the African-American records when they went out of business, Smith out of um, Danville, they all the records went to him and he even had uh, a funeral home here in Frankfurt. And now they don't know where they are. Uh, I had my hands, if I'd had any idea that he was gonna lose those, I would have kept them, <laughs> hid them and try to get you all to hide them or something. But now um, they don't, know where they are and the, the guy that I dealt with has passed away oh, and I'm heartbroken oh gosh there was one of them that I made an index to I did make an index but I didn't do the whole record because I figured he'd have them and I could direct people to him wow. no more oh that's painful wow so what 
are the procedures still the same at the library? Like I can't go behind those doors and browse. I have to get you. Yeah, you have to give us a list and we go back and get them for you. Um, you know, we're, we're constantly wanting those numbers to go down to where we, we can change that so you guys can go back there and we have, to, you know, we can stop quarantining our books. But now the numbers are going up. And so we're even trying to anticipate what do we do if we become a red county? I mean, it's, it's crazy. So yeah, I'm afraid so. So any other, any other questions or? How do you break? I know. <laughs> I know. You've got the best resources where you're not looking. I know. I know. I I browse. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Now there is one other option. I'm gonna let Bill speak to it for a second. There is a browse function in our library that you might enjoy. Yeah, if you go to the catalog, you can actually browse. Uh, let me try and pull it up real fast. That one I wasn't are. expecting. I know you weren't. <laughs> be a curveball. But that is one that you can do, you know, basically you find one book in the area that you think you want, and then you can just literally browse down the cataloging shelf. Um, yep. Yeah, whatever's nearby. So that helps. I think that actually helps a lot when it comes to, especially folks that are looking at, oh gosh, a certain county in Virginia or something, and they don't have those titles, and they are cataloged, you know, over the years and in weird ways. And so yeah, being able to browse that way electronically or digitally is can be helpful too. Right. We'll let him we'll let him find that. Yeah, well, you, you all just keep talking. I'm, keep talking. I'm almost there. Okay. Talking, it seems like it's an inconvenience to you all. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. So any other questions or serendipitous moments that you've had in cemeteries? No. No. Well, I, I actually had one. Um, I was dealing with my husband's family and we were in the uh, Paris, Kentucky Cemetery. And I had, through my research, realized that his, this gentleman, uh, uh, Luther Burden, that his first wife uh, was buried there in 1860. So I found that through research. But when we went to the cemetery, we couldn't find her. And we had already been up to the office and they had pointed us in the direction where he was buried. And we found his second wife and a second wife's mother. And so um, we were, you know, just looking around and we always carry a, a shovel with us and things to clear graves if we have to or clean them up. And so we were cleaning around the graves and uh, I noticed what appeared to be just a pile of little pebbles. And when we went to clear that back, that was her gravestone. It had fallen over and the grass had overgrown and taken over. So we went back, once we realized that she was buried there, we went back to the office and they actually looked in their uh, safe. They had an old safe there. And so they went and looked in their safe and found out that it was the 158th purchase of a plot there in the Paris, Kentucky Cemetery. So it was in 1860. And um, so they had the information there and what wasn't on the tombstone, we were able, because it was broken as well, we were able to get from that record that she found. So that was kind of serendipitous in that we didn't, we didn't give up when we didn't find it. We started looking around and uh, like I said, we always carry our digging tools. So um, my husband would always tell the story about how I had him digging up his two times great grandmother's grave, but that's, you know, it is what it is, and we were very successful, so I'm glad glad for that. Yes, I, I did a similar thing with, um, it was uh, one of the family members, she had died in the 1870s. She was 14 years old, died of typhoid fever, and we couldn't find her grave. There, She was not in inventories from the 1940s, She was, but, but family rumors said she was buried in a certain cemetery. It just so happens in the spring, I was out there, and her grandparents had this beautiful stand of peonies that was coming up. And just down from them was the same stand of peonies, no gravestone. So I went to the car and got a tire iron and started pounding the grass. And just under the sod, there it was. It was in pieces, just like yours. And um, But it was readable enough that I could actually see that and confirm that it was her. So I snapped some pictures and put that up on Find a Grave. I have no idea where the pieces went after that. It was, It's an odd little cemetery because so many stones have broken off. They, they used to place them in the fence row. And then when they took the fence row down, 
they then took some pallets and just sandwiched them all on top of each other. So there's this giant stack of tombstones and you can't read them because you know no one that strong can lift all of those things off yeah. to read them. So it's, yeah, they've made, rendered it. Yeah, you can't even really read anything. So, but anyway, yeah, I don't know. But at least I've documented it, you know, I didn't get her new stone, but mm -hmm. she's recorded now, so. Wow. Okay, now I am now prepared for, for this little thing. Let, let, okay. Let me see if I can do this. All right. Um, so just from here, just going to do a little basic search for Bell County just to bring something up because that's the the main thing you have to be able to have something on there. And so you, you just pull up a record uh, around what you're looking for. And then right down here is browse the shelf. Uh, you can oh, hopefully see that right there. Uh, you just click on browse the shelf and give it a minute or two. Uh, I cheated and, and had it go ahead and pull up some stuff, but uh, it will give you all of the things on either side, uh, call number wise. And so some of it, like I went backwards here, uh, this gets into some close stack items uh, and, and stuff, uh, but call number wise, it, it'll, it's just like browsing the shelf, except in this instance, it's actually a little bit better because actually just being back in the general stacks browsing through, you're gonna miss any close stack item that has a similar call number because the close stacks obviously aren't in the general stacks. And so uh, doing a browse from here, even if you do have access to the stacks to, to do some traditional shelf browsing, it's still advisable to try and do a little bit of shelf browsing here because you're going to get the items that are still related even though they're not directly next to them on the shelf. So just something to think about there. Yeah, because yeah. cataloging can be a little strange in a way because <laughs> I know we look at, you know, our browsing, we like to look at the covers of books and stuff. That's how we get, you know, some of these titles that we look at, but the cataloging actually comes from the title page inside and believe it or not but the title page inside may not be the actual title on the cover i know it's crazy but that's how it works sometimes in library land oh, yeah. and, uh, and as a cataloger uh, you have to be careful because you can get into the habit of actually just looking at the cover and there's been many times that uh, i've gone through an entire ca original cataloging of something and then uh, be done. It's saved. It's out in the world. And, and then I'm, I'm doing the shelf preps uh, and, and I look at the title page and realize that I got the title from the wrong place. And I have to go back and edit my record. And I made it five minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it happens all the time. <laughs> and especially with family histories, I have to say, and little local histories, you know, they I don't know what it is about that they will make that cover an entirely different or just tweak it enough. It's just a few words off. So which make would make it harder to find in the catalog. So yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh gosh. Um, so any other questions? Although I, I guess I'll throw out a, a spooky question. So um, in fact, I was, well, actually I'm gonna show you, share a little something with you. So when you're talking about the the different symbols on gravestones. That's always a fun thing to take a look at. My favorite book, I don't know if you guys can see it, is mm -hmm. Stories in Stone. That's my absolute favorite. I love how narrow it is. It can fit in a bag when you're going to look through the cemeteries. And what's great is that it's got so many images of the symbols that you might you might encounter. And so those are that's a wonderful, wonderful book. We do have a copy here in the library that you can always come take a look. And an amazing index, especially with acronyms, um, all these different crazy, crazy acronyms that you might come across, uh, different fraternal, fraternal organizations, religious organizations, I mean, just amazing. And then there was one I came across today because I was <clears throat> browsing in the shelf because I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> this is one I'd never actually heard of. It's called Digging Up the Dead. If you can see it. Oh. And it is it's quite interesting. It says it's a history of notable American reburials. So 
has anybody got any stories about someone being reinterred? Um, because I know I've had a couple of, especially the older graves have been moved at some point because, because of, you know, um, in fact, somebody mentioned something about that, didn't they? They mentioned about them being moved with, um, oh, with the Army Depot. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Fanny, you have a... Well, um, Isaac Murphy, the jockey, the famous jockey from the 19th century, at one point was moved to the Kentucky Horse Park. Yes. Was, um, and and then the, I think family members or he they, they were they're thinking about maybe removing him, moving him back to the African American Cemetery Number Two. Yeah, because they left his wife Lucy there, from mm -hmm. what I remember, and that was just yeah, that was horrible. I mean, they've got. You know they've got these these monuments to horses in the horse park and then they bring a donkey out just like from the horses i'm like that's just you know moving from his wife and moving from his family yeah. No, 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 no no yeah i think that should go back too that sounds that sounds like a much better he meant to be buried there i'm sure that's where he chose that's where his family chose that you know exactly. oh goodness um, the the markers well, of course it's backwards on mine oh i but, forgot anyway, about those the, the marker series is another uh, there's uh like five or six in the series uh it's interesting uh, uh some 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 of the symbology and stuff like what you were talking about is also discussed in here this is published by the journal of Associ the journal of the association for gravestone study and uh it has some of that similar history and and even the stone cutters themselves and where you can see similarities from uh, gravestone to gravestone even in different cemeteries around a, a populous area and so it, it's got some interesting stuff too yeah one of the one of the things i also cover in the in the session that i'm going to post is about grave robbing actually that there was a really horrible problem with that in the later 19th century and um, not as much in the central Kentucky area, it was more along the rivers. So Louisville and Cincinnati, Cincinnati had a horrible problem with that. Um, and into Northern Kentucky. And even now the reinterment actually solved one of our family, it wasn't a mystery. Actually, one of the cousins said there was an eyewitness who said this person that when their grandfather was buried in a small family plot that someone actually after midnight had seen someone on horseback going to the cemetery and then came out with a white draped figure over the horse. And so they had assumed that the body had been stolen. And they even in the story said, they thought it was old Doc Brown, I think he said, or old Doc Thomas, um, taking the body to the medical college to figure out why they died. And so they already knew that body snatching was actually an issue. You know, um, there were, there's some published stories about it. Back then um, there was an entire network of of body snatching folks that was uh, in the Cincinnati area. And it was a network that even went all the way up into Illinois, they or actually into Indianapolis and, um, and then up into Illinois. It was quite a conduit there. And yeah, I mean, that's a possibility. Um, when we did though, when they, they dug up our great, great, great grandfather in 2013 to have him move, there were bones there. So we all just kind of looked at the story and said, okay, what was that person drinking that night after midnight when they saw this happen in the cemetery? Because clearly there's a body there. I don't know. Unless it's a different body, I, I really have no idea <laughs> what that story was about. But, yeah. I heard rumors of some of those Cincinnati bodies coming south too. Really? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't remember where I heard it, but I heard uh, I heard some of them uh, from maybe even Transylvania uh -huh. and the medical college there. It, it was all about getting cadavers to do, a, yes. to do their gross anatomy yes. myth and that kind yes. of thing. Yes, and in fact, Cincinnati, I think they said at one point they had, well, they had several medical colleges and they advertised in the paper every year that each student would have their own cadaver to dissect. And the thing is, there's, there weren't enough bodies for that. It wasn't legal to do that. It wasn't legal to donate your body to science. They, they were really, and the reason they changed the law was because, um, President Harrison's son was actually found in the basement of the medical college. His body had went missing right after burial. And so it was this big scandal because they're like, oh my gosh, they even had somebody watching the grave and they started, they just went down into the basement and there he was. So that actually then got the ear of the legislature. And so they 
yeah, they started changing some laws about that. So <laughs> that was a very crazy chapter in, in burial history. Although we're not, we're not the only ones by any means. Um, even in Scotland, that was a big story. They had a lot of, a lot of that going on. And um, there's even a really crazy dark comedy movie about that. I can't remember what it is, but true story about the guys who actually were executed for doing all of that because they, it was, they had done so much, but yeah. I mean, okay, so you mentioned Transylvania and I know this is getting recorded. It's probably really bad that I'm gonna tell this story, but I don't know, my, this is my theory. I know uh, Eastern State Hospital, I know a lot of the, the bodies from, cause that, that, that hospital started in the 1820s and you know, all the way. So all that chapter, they, you know, there's a, there's a group that's actively trying to find all of those who were buried there or should have been buried there over the years. It's a Facebook group. They've been doing this for years. They even have their own website and everything. And, They've done a lot of fantastic work and they've, they've helped them actually locate some bodies, but they, they said they're missing thousands. They don't understand why there's not enough bodies in that area. They even looked near, um, what was it, the, Le the Lexmark factory, you know, um, they, they thought maybe it was out there. And I, my theory is that they were taken to the medical colleges because the guy that started the hospital was actually, um, he was like a, a neuro doctor and in Cincinnati, and there's a railroad track right next to that hospital, and I'm pretty sure that's where all the bodies went, but they, uh -huh. it's not a popular, it's not a popular opinion. <laughs> they don't spread that one because that's a little awkward, but yeah, I mean, that Transylvania may have had some of them. Louisville Medical College also had some of those, the medical colleges in Louisville at the time also had some stories of, you know, getting local bodies and such, and crazy craziness. Well, anytime you go to a doctor, you should be thankful uh, because the AMA would not have ever learned anything. And a lot of our healing today is a result of those body thieves. True. And even Spring Grove Cemetery and Cemetery Cemetery in Cincinnati has a monument they put in the cemetery not too long ago that honors all of those who gave their body to science like willingly or unwillingly, like there's this, this whole thing about, yeah, their honor, trying to honor how many bodies were actually used for that. So yeah, it's true. Yeah. I'm sure it is. <laughs> okay. Any other cemetery records or cemetery stories anybody wants to share? I have something I could share. Uh, it's not directly about a cemetery. But I was at an event and uh, at a table with a bunch of people and uh, they were sort of horrified. The speaker was a uh, person who was digging up Indian remains and uh, the laws today require that they be returned and it came up uh, that a number of bodies had been returned to uh, their native tribes. And so I asked these two ladies who were so offended that their museums were losing these bodies. I said, well, you could probably have them replaced. Why don't you gather up your family and, and dig up those grandparents and send them over? And those, the two ladies that had been talking were just horrified. They thought, who is this person who even suggests such a thing? But that's exactly what we've done for years uh, with the, uh, the Smithsonian and, and many other museums I've been a part of, uh, we've been collecting other people's bodies. We should be willing to uh, give our own body or give our ancestors body if we're going to want to see those things in the museum. Yeah, there was a story recently, I just read this just a few days ago, and it's about one one of the specimens, I think, in like the British Museum or something, and uh, it was a guy that was really, really tall. And what was so sad, and they'd had him, I don't know, maybe a hundred years or so. And what was so sad was that he specifically said he didn't want his body ending up in the museum. And what do they do? There he is. So, you know, they're actually talking about the possibility of, of honoring his wish and finally burying him. So, yeah. So one little thing I know, um, Anissa, could you tell everybody a little bit about that, um, that grave marking group that you found? That is, for those who want to mark a grave, this is a, a very um, economic solution. Oh, oh, took me a second. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was called, hang on a minute. Because I always get it wrong. I, I call it mark, mark a grave or mark every grave. Let me see what it is. Yes, 
called markeverygrave.com. And uh, you can get small things. It, there, it's granite. And you can get small things for like $25. I got a 12 by 12 for 99. Um, they even they messed it up and they redid it for free. Um, and if you go to find a grave and look up Henrietta Duke, um, you can see, yep, that's it. Um, and, and if you go to uh, findagrave.com and you look up Henrietta Duke, uh, that is the stone uh, that I purchased. And what this, and usually you need to, if you're gonna put it in a cemetery, make sure you get permission from the cemetery. Um, what the sexton at the Georgetown Cemetery um, did for me, oh, they're gonna pull up Henrietta. Yeah, um, I'm curious to see what the paver looks like. Um, what they did for me is they just pulled up, she's in the Georgetown Cemetery. Keep going. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, she's Henrietta Keenan. Sorry, that's her married name. Sorry, Henrietta Duke Keenan. Sorry, Keenan. K E E N O N. Sorry. Um, and what the sexton of the Georgetown Cemetery did, um, yeah, O N, yeah, that's her. Um, he uh, poured this concrete for me. It stands only about 12 inches high, it's not big at all, uh, but it fits there nicely. Um, he glued this to it. He put some kind of epoxy, clear epoxy thing over it so it would never be um, damaged like by weather. Um, and it's up high enough that it won't get mowed over. Um, and of course, it is much smaller than her daughter, which is on the left, and her parents, which are on the right. Um, and we could never figure out why there wasn't a stone for her because they had money. Um, Oh, her obituary talks about they donated money here, there, everywhere. Um, but you know, there she is. And um, and it says in memory of, um, because according to um, the cemetery record, she's buried in that area. And it just makes sense that she's between her parents and her daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, but because it's not conclusive, the sexton suggested that we do in memory of, so people would know that she, you know, she's somewhere in there. Um, but not actually there. We think she is because there's a dip, um, but you know, there is. I like that. I like the in memory of, I think that's a really great solution when you can't specifically pinpoint yeah. that. That's really cool. Yeah. And they were very nice. It cost me, um, for the Sexton to do that, it cost me a meatloaf and mashed potato meal. Wow. <laughs> that's what he wanted. He said, I want you to make me your meatloaf and your mashed potato. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and his wife doesn't eat that kind of food. So, I mean, I made him like eight or 10 mashed little meatloaf loaves the way I do it. And like a giant pan. I mean, like five pounds of potatoes. And he was set from, yeah, he was set for a while. I, well, when I made it, I didn't know his wife didn't eat it. So I was like, okay, mm -hmm. this is a meal for two plus some leftovers. And right. Now, yeah, so now he wants to know what else I'm working on in, in the cemetery so he can get more meatloaf and mashed potatoes. That's awesome. Oh, that's a good story. Now, I always make like friends with the sexton of the cemetery. Always make friends with the sexton of the cemetery. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to show one other thing. I know when people are trying to find out where records or how they can how they can find records, this is one that specific to KHS. Um, I love to show this when I can is the infamous graveyard quilt. Um, that's one of those really unique artifacts in a family <laughs> where they had the names on a coffin and they had sewn them around the edges. And then as someone died, they would unstitch that and then restitch it in the center for the family plot. Now, as you can see, the family never finished because technically they moved around a little bit. So that family plot. They didn't, they didn't stick with that. I think they moved up to Ohio at one point. So yeah, it was an interesting plan, but yeah, that's a very famous one. We get a lot of requests for that one. Okay, so how can I find out what cemeteries were around in Clark County, 1890? 1890. Okay, my best bet for cemeteries and I'm, and I can't tell you that you're going to be 
that you're going to know the names of the cemeteries, but have you tried those really large atlases that are that were published in like the 1870s and 80s? Um, we've got a series of them. I'm not sure how many have been digitized and put online, but um, we've got they're they're like in portfolio size. And what's great is it goes to the county. It kind of cordons off the county, quarters it off, and um, you'll see you'll see some places that you know they'll have little cemeteries on there. And they'll have names of people where they live and everything along. Now, it was kind of like, I think it wasn't every single person. I think they also did pay to have their name in there. But, you know, to note cemeteries back then would be good. Also, if you have some rumors about some cemeteries, I also suggest aerial photography from around like the 1940s, 1940s, 50s, 60s just to see um, if you suspect there's a family plot somewhere on a farm. Sometimes those aerial photos will show where, I like to say at least in Kentucky, if a farmer knew there was a cemetery there, he would usually avoid it. And there's a big growth. There's a big area of trees or growth that he wouldn't do. I mean, obviously in Kentucky, it's against the law to plow up a cemetery, but you know, um, yeah, there was, that's a, a clue because especially in the 40s, 50s and 60s, um, at least in the places that I'm, I'm familiar with, the farming was just so much more active. You had so much cleared land. It was just really, really active. And then you have that significant space where there's a bunch of brush that nobody's touching right there. Um, so that can be a clue to those. And usually UK has a lot of those aerial photos. Scott County, Scott County has theirs because I've been in the planning and zoning and they've pulled it up and it looks really cool. But I have like Carrie's obituary, which mm -hmm. is not helpful. Uh, it just says that uh, her funeral was preached by Reverend J.J. Chisholm and the remains interred in the cemetery at this place. Um, she leaves behind a husband who is very low with the same dread malady and two little children. Then his obituary says, um, his room, because he died in Justin County with his sister, says his remains were brought to this city and interned by the side of his wife who died a short time ago of the same disease. And this is out of the Winchester newspaper. Yeah, not helpful. So like this place. So my thing is, so bear interred at the cemetery at this place. At this so, place. Yeah, so what is at this place? Oh gosh. Could that be the church? I, well, um, and I've Googled Reverend Chisholm and um, he was part of the Trans Transylvania Presbytery. So I guess I could call them now that maybe they're halfway open and yeah. But actually I went through um, um, churches. I was bugging a lot of churches and I actually found um, a list. I can't remember where I put it, but I found a list of people, a list of congregants and yeah, handwritten. And out to the side, it, it said like died and like the date and what, I mean, it was like, I mean, at least half this congregation died and it was in a cemetery, it was in a church, I mean, a newer church, and I think it probably had absorbed this other one, uh, but the people there were not real knowledgeable about where people would have been buried in the 1890s. Wow. Yeah. And you know, another one, honestly, another, I know it's it's later, but just off an off chance that they knew, um, even old, even roadmaps from the 1930s also will have that little cemetery symbol out in the county, out in the rural areas, but um, yeah. I'm trying to think of other places that might have that. But yeah, crazy. Yeah. Well, this you know, place, that's welcome just so my world. Helpful. Just so not helpful, is it? <laughs> this place. <laughs> welcome to my, I know, at this place. <laughs> well, what was it? Billy, you just saw a, a map today that said something about <laughs> a plat of the map of, I see a map of the plat or part of Frankfurt, this part of the, <laughs> It was like, this is a map of this part of Frankfurt or this part of the, the city. It was, yeah, then designate I'm one part. I'm going to try and find that again. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was quite humorous. It was crazy. We laughed about that for a little while at the desk today. I, yeah. I need to look at the ref desk email for that. <laughs> I think someone did mention this, but on some of the old um, probate records, um, if you go through those, it does list sometimes where the stone was delivered 
um, because that was turned in as uh, needing to be paid for out of the estate. Um, you know, and so once in a while it will actually name the cemetery. Doesn't always, but sometimes. That's great. That's actually a really great selection mm -hmm. or suggestion. Um, yeah, even that was actually how the article I wrote for the color epidemic with Gideon Shryock, that was, it was someone who had called and she said in her ancestors probate record, there was a notation of basically them paying the the coffin maker and the undertaker and then they paid getting a triac and so at that point she was like what are they paying him for and this was during there were it was a cholera epidemic victim and so i said he he was an architect he also did some some uh, some tombstones and i said but you know what it could be a couple things he actually was burying people that day so i don't know if he had provided anything or if he had done that i don't know but with the amount of money it actually sounded like he was designing a stone um, which I wish he did as well. So yeah, there's definitely some burial details that can be in a probate record. So yeah, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, I can't find that thing. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, you especially can't now because that title is just so crazy. Uh, yeah. You, you you literally typed in Frankfurt map, didn't you? Oh, that's right. That, that, that's right. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can't remember what the search term and why. Yeah. But now, now that you said that, uh, I, yes, I'll find it now because <laughs> it was the first hit. Uh, let's see that there no it wasn't the first hit but yeah um, that's pretty close there we go um, um, okay and so the title I, I thought this was us being stupid was <laughs> the plan of that part of the town of frank well as you go in and see let me zoom in by the way bill is also demonstrating how content dm has upgraded and so in order to zoom in on anything, you literally have to click on that little arrow. <laughs> yes, it out. that little double arrow oh, thing. Mm -hmm. Which is crazy. Yeah. But, but, but as you can see, they actually titled this from way 1796, the plan of that part of the town of Franklin. Lying on. Lying on the south side, yeah. the, the lots and streets, right? <laughs> but the plan of that part of the town of Franklin. Right? So, yeah, uh, people are crazy no matter what era they are in. Yep. Yeah, but th this is a little arrow that we're talking about. Whenever you pull up something in the digital catalog uh, it, and it gives you a nice image like that, uh, go ahead and click on that. If it's a PDF, then you'll be able to easily scroll through the different pages. If it's just a single nice big image like this, then you'll be able to zoom in and manipulate it around to to be able to see what you need to see. Can you make out the names of the street? Oh yeah, I see third. Fourth. Yeah, South of course Frankfurt. it's upside down, but South Frankfurt. Yeah, I see. <laughs> you, you can't ask for everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's Shelby Street. They, they, they made the top part readable, and, and then the actual map not, and so it just kind of depends. And uh, you yeah. can rotate it around. Yeah, so yeah, really, you, uh, Campbell, Todd. Yeah. Um, that used to be third. all built in when you first landed on that page, and it was so yeah. convenient you could just zoom right in or you know manipulate that. But now you literally have to pop that out in order to do that. And and even with the PDF, if you run across the PDF entry, it will literally only show you one page. It that you don't even look like you've got multiple pages. You've yeah. got to pop it out to see and to scroll down. It's yeah. Yeah. So if the names of the streets have stayed the same, you can figure out what part that is. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And in fact, in Frankfurt, they did have a couple of changes with some of their streets. And so I usually suggest that people go to the Sanborn maps and at least go through a few different decades to make sure that the street and the naming, not only street names sometimes have changed, but the numbering of the houses definitely changed. Yep. Within a, around 1910 or so, they changed everybody's numbers. Um, so yeah, the Sandborn maps can help you see where that change was. Mm -mm. That's, that's wild. Welcome to our world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you everyone. We've hit our witching hour of four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> thank you all for coming. This has been really fun. And um, thanks so much. Have a happy Halloween, y'all. Happy Halloween. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Looking forward to the links. All right, we'll do next week. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Good to see everybody. You too. Bye, Mary. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.